Welcome to the Essential Southern Podcast, where we explore the rich history, culture, and traditions of the American South. Welcome back to the Essential Southern Podcast, sponsored by the Abbeville Institute. I am your host, Brian McClanahan, and thank you for joining us. If you do enjoy this podcast, go to abbevilleinstitute.org, that's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org, and consider making a donation to the Institute. We do exist on your generous contributions alone. So this podcast is part of that. Also, our website, our conferences, all the things we do. Again, that's abbevilleinstitute.org, A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org, where we explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. All right, well, let's talk about the, uh, the topic, and that would be Richard Weaver's conclusion to his magnificent The Southern Tradition at Bay. Now, Richard Weaver was one of the most important intellectual figures of the South in the 20th century. He started as a socialist and eventually came around to defending his section and his people. But more than that, Weaver was recognized for a time as one of the most important conservative intellectuals in the United States. His dissertation was entitled The Southern Tradition at Bay, and eventually it was published. And it is a look at post-bellum thought. Now, this is perhaps the most important period of time to study in Southern history, not the antebellum South, not the wartime South, but the postbellum South. And in fact, this is the period of time that's now being so hotly contested by the establishment, whether it's on the left or the right, because it's that memory, how Southerners remembered their past, that is now controversial. It's the symbols, the monuments the things that have become part of the identity of the Southern people. And those are the things under attack. It's that memory. It's as David Blight talks about in his book, uh, Race and Reunion. It's It's a memory study. And so this is what people want to attack. They want to attack the way Southerners remembered their people. It's not John C. Calhoun. He's, he's easy to take down because Calhoun made statements in favor of slavery. It's not even the leaders of the war who are also easy to take down. It's how people after the war, at least from the establishment perspective, it's how people after the war chose to remember that time before the war and the war itself. But as Weaver says, there's a, we have to take that, that sentiment and move it forward. He actually talks about progress. I want to go through this epilogue to this chapter. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. We don't have time for that and the constraints that I want to do for this podcast. But to go through the epilogue and as Weaver beautifully explains how the Southern tradition still offers something to modern America. That is the entire premise of the Abbeville Institute. The tradition itself offers something. And it's our job to talk about what that something is and how we can use it. So, again, this is from the Southern Tradition at Bay. It is the epilogue to the book. Weaver says, History is a liberal art, and one profits by studying the whole of it, including the lost causes. What a beautiful statement. It's a liberal art, and one profits by studying the whole of it, including the lost causes. In fact, you can make a case that they're the only ones to study. The only causes to study are the ones that are lost. And we do this throughout history. We study all kinds of lost causes and don't use it as a pejorative. But to say it's a liberal art, not a social science, would almost be a heresy today. But it is an art. History is an art. He says, all of us are under a mortal temptation to grant the accomplished fact more than we should. That the fall of Rome, the dissolution of medieval Catholicism, the overthrow of Napoleon, the destruction of the Old South were purposeful and just are conclusions that only the tough-minded will question. Again, beautiful. Only the tough-minded. The people that just, yeah, the Old South was bound to fall, all these things. Why? Only the tough-minded will question these assumptions. When you look at people that accept, accept the righteous cause myth of America, they're not, they're just, they're just going along with the established order. They don't really question these things. If you're listening to this podcast, if you're reading our website, if you're doing those things, you are questioning these things. As Weaver said, that would make you tough-minded because you're asking important questions. But such events, hammered out by soldiers and politicians, 
by adventurers and traders are hardly a guide to the moral world. They are texts for the lesson, not the lesson itself, which should go beyond the waywardness of events. Behind all there must be a conception of what can show the facts in something more than their temporal accidents. In this research, however, in this research, therefore, I'm sorry, I have attempted to find those things in the struggle of the South which speak for something more than a particular people in a special situation. The result, it may be allowed, is not pure history, but a picture of values and sentiments coping with the forces of a revolutionary age, and though failing, hardly expiring. What is the Southern tradition, and what does it offer America? That's the question, and this whole book is about that. This is the basis of the Abbeville Institute from 2002 till now. What can the Southern tradition and all of its things, and Weaver was aware of the things that the Southern tradition couldn't provide or the things that it shouldn't provide, but what could it do? He says, The South possesses an inheritance which it has imperfectly understood and little used. It is the, in the curious position of having been right without realizing the grounds of its rightness. I am conscious that this reverses the common judgment. But it may yet appear that the North, by its ready embrace of science and rationalism, impoverished itself, and that the South, by clinging more or less unashamedly to the primitive way of life, prepared itself for the longer run. Now, what he's done here is just flipped everything on its head. He's saying, look, I'm aware that this is the exact opposite of what people think. The South was the impoverished area, the, the area that was backward and behind. But maybe the North, by agreeing with Science and rationalism has actually impoverished itself, not the other way. But the South, in clinging to a primitive way of life, has actually established itself for the long run. He says, It is an old Southern custom, however, to take too sanguine a view of the, of the section's record. And before going further with this prophecy, one should make a candid examination of failures. The South committed two great errors in the struggle against the modern world, errors characteristic for it, but not disastrous consequences. The first was a fair to study its position until it arrived at metaphysical foundations. No Southern spokesman was ever able to show why the South was right finally. In other words, the South never perfected its worldview, which determines in the end what we want and what we are. Legal arguments like those of the Apologia are but a superstructure resting upon more fundamental assumptions. Journalistic defenses, however brilliant in phrase, are likely to be even less, and fiction may serve only as a means of propagation. The South spoke well on a certain level, but it did not make the indispensable conquest of the imagination. From the Bible and Aristotle, it might, might have produced its Summa Theologica, but none measured up to the task, and there is no evidence that the performance would have been rewarded. It needed a Burke or a Hegel. It produced lawyers and journalists. Perhaps the sin for which the South has most fully, though unknowingly, atoned in its, is its failure to encourage the mind. Some fringes of excess it has thereby avoided, but it has had to compete against the great world with second-rate talent, and to accept the defense where an offense or offensive was indicated. One may understand the feelings which could boast of the South's freedom from isms, but this implies the existence of a satisfactory theology and metaphysics which were not on hand. The lack continues, and today we behold Southern writers of amazing resource and virtuosity, I should instance here Thomas Wolfe, thrashing about in the world and almost terrifying us with their potentially, potentiality, but leaving in the end nothing but the record of an enormous sensibility. The average Southerner, pushed beyond the rather naive, naive assumptions with which he sanctions his world, becomes helpless and explodes in anger. So, Weaver saying, yeah, the South needed to go on the offense, right? It needed to take the offensive position. It needed to explain what it was and what it offered. It never had a Burke. What is this thing? What is this Southern tradition and why is it valuable? Weaver's going to try to explain some of that. But it never did it. It had its lawyers, it had its journalists, it has its writers, and all these things are important. It has its musicians. But what was it about the South that offered a counterweight to the world? What was it about the South, or the Southern tradition most importantly, that could have sustained America and not had it rush headlong into a disaster?
Another great failure, and one for which people cannot be readily forgiven, is the surrender of initiative. So little has this section shown since 1865 that one is prompted to question whether the South ever really believed in itself. It is not that the South is uncreative. On the contrary, it is pregnant with full and full of dreams. It is always sending abroad some novelty be adapted and perfected. The list would be long and astonishing, but it seems to have no faith in its own imprimatur. It has been unwilling to buy books and magazines unless they come with the prestige of a northern publisher. Indeed, this preference has extended over a vast range of things. Does it bespeak some deep-lying sense of incompetence, of inadequacy? The, sus the supposition classes with the widely noticed presumption and, and conceit of the southerner, with his faith in the righteous rightness of his way of life, which have irritated num numberless people from the outside. This is a really important point. The South has always been looking for an attaboy from the North, for acceptance, for agreement. And what Weaver is saying, it didn't need that. It needed to be the leader. It needed to be unashamed of what it was. It needed to be Virginia. There was a time Virginia led. This is what John C. Calhoun said in the Antebellum Pier. Virginia needs to lead. Calhoun was unashamed to be a Southerner. That's what John Randolph of Roanoke. I mean, all these people were saying, we need to lead. Don't be afraid of who you are. This is Mel Bradford. Remember who you are. Don't be afraid of those things and promote them with vigor. Be proud of it. But that tradition and tell people, well, I mean, this is just a way forward. This is a good thing. We don't need your permission. We don't need your approval. You would be better off being like us. But we're not going to force you to be it. It's an example of how to live. He says, I believe there is at bottom a consciousness of failure. Probably the decision of 1865 has been interpreted too literally. It has been regarded as casting a cloud over all Southern endeavors, so that the Southerner, despite efforts at compensation, has been unable to convince himself. And more than likely, this is to be traced to the first failure, the lack of a fundamental position from which he could judge his achievements with some assurance that the judgment would be vindicated. In summary, I would say that the South needs now, as much as ever before, a metaphysic of its position, and that it must recover initiative at least to the point of following a right course without waiting for the North or for Washington to express approbation. Only this can diminish its hypersensitivity to criticism, which makes the task even of its friends difficult. It needs to not wait for Washington to approve, or the North to approve, or the left nowadays to approve. It just needs to be what it is, and not care what everyone else says. What is it? One might hesitate to say that the South with such weakness has anything to offer our age. But there is something in his heritage, half lost, derided, betrayed by its own sons, which continues to fascinate the world. It's one of my favorite lines from the entire book. This is a momentous fact, for the world is seeking, as perhaps never before, the thing that will lift up our hearts and restore our faith in human communities. We wrote this, I mean, it's approaching now, almost a century ago. But there is something in the Southern tradition that people like. The search is not new. It began before the brashness of 19th century confidence had worn away, and Henry Adams, wearied with the plausibilities of his day, looked for some higher reality in the 13th century synthesis of art and faith. In a parallel way, victims of the can fusions and frustrations of our own time, turn with live interest to that fulfillment represented by the Old South. And it is what they, and it is that, and it is this that they find, excuse me, the last non-materialist civilization in the Western world. It is this ref, uh, refuge of sentiments and values, of spiritual congeniality, a belief in the world, of reverence for symbolism, whose existence haunts the nation. It is damned for its virtues and praise for its faults, and there are those who wish its annihilation. But most revealing of all is the fear that it generates the revolutionary impulse of our future. Look, I will say this about people that were opposing monuments. One of the things, or say the Maryland State Song, they're symbols of defiance to the, to the order that the establishment wants to uh, use for American society. They are a threat. 
as Weaver points out in many ways, maybe a metaphysical threat. They're a threat to them because they are symbols of things they don't like. And that is their order. They have to be done away with because if they're not done away with, well, that people will still use them as symbols of defiance. We don't like you. We don't want you to rule us. We don't want Washington, D.C. to rule us. I mean, look, when, when some of these dedication speeches were made, this point was made, look, these statues still represent a defiance. We're still not interested in being ruled by Washington, D.C. And if they're still there, people will still cling to them. So they have to go because they are a challenge to the new order of America. And this is why people like them for a long time. Looking at the whole of the South's promise and achievement, I would be unwilling to say that it offers a foundation, or because of some accidents of history, even an example. The most that it can offer is a challenge. And I, look, I agree, a challenge. And the challenge is to save the human spirit by recreating a non-materialist society. Only this can rescue us from failure of nihilism, urged on by the force of technology and our own moral defeatism. Demonical is what he calls it, the demonical force of technology. The first step will be to give the common man a worldview completely different from that which he has constructed out of his random knowledge of science. Without this, the various schemes of salvation are but palliatives. What man thinks about the world when he is driven back to his deepest reflections and most secret promptings will finally determine all that he does. We might well ask for a second coming to accomplish this change. But we must put aside the temptation of literalism and consider from what source we are likely to get the need for revelation. Barring the advent of an illumination of by some fateful personality, the task falls upon poets, artists, intellectuals, upon workers in the timeless. We must again hearken to these unacknowledged legislators of mankind. They alone can impress us with some splendid image of man in a morally designed world embodied, ennobled, I'm sorry, by a conception of the transcendent. It has to come down to the intellectuals to say this is what the Southern tradition can offer. This is what it can be. They will have to abandon, and I'm sure they will be ready to abandon, the tortured imaginings of our vexed decades. The rift between them and the people has not been a rift of their own making, but the symptom of a deep lesion, and its cure will have to be a part of the healing of the nations. The common man is now ready to discard his, his bastard notions of science and materialism, intellectual hobbies of a hundred years ago. Nor do I speak cynically here of a pendulum movement in fads. Non-materialist views of the world have flourished for most of our history have inspired our best art and held together our healthiest communities. This is indeed the natural view, whereas the other is symbolic of spiritual decadence. The South held this view and fought for it long behind the barricades of revealed Christianity, of humanism, of sentiment. It battled somewhat ineptly for lack of adequate weapons, but with inner conviction. Now it can return as to the house of its fathers. I mean... He's saying the South has fought this fight, but it hasn't really been equipped well. But if you have the intellectual backing of it, someone like Richard Weaver, someone like Mel Bradford, this is why these essential Southern documents, this is what we're doing with this podcast at the Abbeville Institute, to get you these things, to make you think about this. And if you can, and the book is still in print, go get the Southern tradition at bay and read it. Weaver makes some really important points about the Southern tradition. He says, For the present tendency of the world's great states is in the direction of a dictator or emperor worship. It is not a chosen course. The emperor will be elevated to his throne by science. He will be the source of control, of power too dangerous for distributive ownership. Today we are running from our, inven from our, from our inventions, excuse me, hiding from them, trying to reason away their awful or potentialities. We shall soon have to perceive that science is democratic only in a treacherous sense. <laughs> I mean, could you say something more prophetic? It's democratic only in a treacherous sense. We look at all these technologies and other things that we do. And of course, science is the climate crisis. I mean, these are things that we're looking at. It's democratic as treacherous. True, it brings the same thing to everyone. War to the babe in the cradle. It compl compels virtually all men to listen to radio edicts. But what are the sources of the edicts? 
We are being narrowed down to one nation, to one world, in which nobody can move an elbow without jostling those in the furthest corner. And the danger of friction is so great that liberty of opposition must be decreased, channeled, and there must stand ready a supreme authority ready to strike down any menace to peace, to its peace, to the status quo. What did I just say about monuments? That's what it's doing. It is creating a monoculture in America, but not just in America, the new world order. This is what you know, George H.W. Bush called it, but that's the point. That's, the, that's what people want. It has to be the monoculture. The emperor or dictator of completely persuasive authority backed by an oligarchy of scientists, that is the situation to which forces are hurrying us. The state becomes a monolith, rigid with fear that it has lost control of its destiny. We all stand today at Appomattox, and we are surrendering to a world which this hypostasized science has made in our despite. By restoring the moral and aesthetic medium, we shall have a leverage on this. We can will our world and retrieve our defeat by an upward con conversion. This will revive those differences which mean as much to living as rules mean to a game, which are indeed the living that is not sustained by bread alone. Then man can, can again see his life as a drama and know that the transfiguring interest that comes through conflict. The conflict will not be a meaningless strife of forces into which scientists and utilitarians sought to usher him, but a conflict in the old sense of religious drama between him, with which he can apprehend of the good and the powers of evil. Now, there is a certain... Th this kind of rhetoric is used by America now. We look at foreign policy. We have the axis of evil and these kind of things. There's good and evil. But Weaver would, would question that because what they're doing there is, is the exact opposite of what he's actually suggesting. There is a moral evil in things, particularly at the local and the humane sense. But it's not our job to do that everywhere else. He talks about communities and to keep your community safe from whatever evil you perceive. And for m most Southerners, it's going to be a culture that's alien to tradition. He says, distinctions of many kinds will have to be restored, and I would, me would mention especially one whose loss is added immeasurably to the malaise of our civilization, the fruitful distinction between the sexes with the recognition of respective spheres of influence. Well, this is, I mean, this is why Weaver is persona non grata for a lot on the left. I mean, you can't say that. He's, he looks at the erosion of distinction between men and women as a real fundamental disaster. There has to be a distinction. Men have to be men. Women have to be women. Now, look at what's happened in modern society. That has been completely obliterated. I mean, and I say completely, I mean it completely obliterated now if the establishment can have their way. There is no distinction anymore. Weaver was saying these things in the mid-20th century. If you look at the great book, uh, Who Owns America? There's actually an essay on this in there. The reestablishment of woman as the cohesive force of the family, the end of the era of long-haired men and short-haired women, should bring a renewal of well-being to the whole of society. On this point, Southerners of the old school are adamant, and even today, with our power of discrimination at its lowest point in history, there arises a feeling that the roles of the sexes must again be made explicit. George Fitzhugh's brutal remark that if women put on trousers, men would use them for plowing has been borne out. And I think that women would have more influence, actually, if they did not vote, but according to the advice of Augusta Evans Wilson, made their fireside sex of, of Delphic wisdom. So, of course, that is, you, know, you can't say that at all now. Uh, and this, again, I mean, Weaver's being, saying, well, this is what we should do. Now, we can say yes or no to that, but he's making a point. What has happened? This was the attack on modern feminism, or at least in this way, old feminism, is pointing out. One word of advice must be given to workers for this new order. Considerations of strategy and tactics forbid the use of symbols of lost causes. There cannot be a return to the Middle Ages of the, or the Old South under slogans identified with them. The principles must be studied and used, but in such presentation that mankind will feel the march is forward. And so too it will be to all effects 
It is a serious thing to take from the average man, and perhaps from anyone, his belief in progress. The average man's metaphysic is summed up by this word, progressive, is his token of approval. Therefore, the future will always be the future. We need not lecture tediously on the imperishability of principles. It is enough if we let them inform the new order while adorning them with the attractions of the hour. The river of knowledge often turns back on itself, and there are progressive rev revolutions to an earlier condition. As long as we keep our, con our course clear by acknowledging the primacy of knowledge and virtue and avoid a surrender to suppositions, objective necessity, we can still reconstruct our life on a humane basis. And, I mean, this is important. We can still restore. We can't, we can't avoid the, the charge of progress. We can't avoid that. It has to be there. This is where he's saying we have to be moving forward. We have to frame these things as part of a progressive sentiment. When we had our 20th anniversary conference at Callaway Gardens in Stone Mountain, uh, Stone Mountain, Pine Mountain, Georgia, excuse me, Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia, I attached the Old South to the Callaway family and then to the New South and then to the Modern South. There is a continuity, and that's something we have to say, but we always have to be acknowledging that there are things of progress, and if you can use them properly and show that tradition actually works with these things and, and gives them meaning, well then, people can't be, you can't say, well, I'm just going to be backwards. This is the common reaction. Well, it's just backwards. We can't be backwards. But you can make critiques of progress in the present. Well, maybe this isn't good. Maybe these things aren't just. Maybe these things aren't moral or virtuous. There's something about these traditions. Traditions always move. But these traditions offer a way forward. He says, there's a certain harrowing alternative to be pointed out as a possibility of an action in our failure. It is undeniable that there are numerous resemblances between the southern agrarian mind and the mind of modern fascism, and I would affirm that fascism, too, in its ultimate character, is a protest against materialist theories of history and society. This is certain despite the fact that fascism immersed itself in materialist techniques for its conquests and thereby failed. This other society, too, believes in ho ho holiness and heroism, but it is humane, enlightened, and insists on regard for personality more than do modern forms of statism under liberal and socio-democratic banners. So Weaver is making an important point here, and it's something we cannot miss. He's saying the agrarian mind, there tends to be this flirtation with fascism. That this, this tends to move in that direction. And unfortunately, you do see that at times, even today. So he's cautioning people. Fascism is not the Southern tradition. Fascism and the Southern tradition are incompatible, even though they might, there are parts of it that you could say, well, these people like this and these people like this, but they're incompatible. And he says, why? The Southern tradition is humane, enlightened, and it insists on regard for personality more than do modern forms of statism under liberal and social democratic banners. It's more humane, more enlightened, and, regard, and its regard for personality is better than fascism, which is statist, and of course it's progressive in the socio-democratic sense. He's saying they're not, they're not the same, and they can't be confused for that. Now that, above all, in meeting the problem of motivation, it does what social democracy has never been able to do. Now that truth can once more be told, let us admit that fascism had secret sympathizers in every corner of the world and from every social level. It attracted by its call to achievement, by its poetry, by its offer of a dramatic life. It attracted even by its call to men to be hard on themselves. Social democracy will never be able to compete with this by promising to each a vine-covered cottage by the road and cradle-to-grave social security. People who are yet vital want a challenge in life. They want opportunity to win distinction. Even those societies which permit distinction solely through the accumulation of wealth and its ostentatious display, such as ours, have been, are better than those that permit none. He's saying, look, it had sympathizers. Fascism had sympathizers, but the Southern tradition is not that. And it's a challenge because it doesn't offer the same things. 
This is why people gravitate towards it, because it offers this social... I mean, look, fascism is a leveling ideology. And there has to be a distinction. The Southern tradition offers distinction. It has to. Excellence. Fascism offers nothing of that. From the bleakness of a social bureaucracy, men will sooner or later turn to something stirring. They will dictate again to live strenuously or romantically. And then he has a great conclusion. The Old South may indeed be a hall hung with splendid tapestries in which no one would care to live, but from then we can learn something of how to live. So there's a lot in that essay, in this concluding chapter. The South needs a metaphysical defense. The tradition needs a metaphysical defense from poets, intellectuals, musicians, from the people that create art. Not just from the, from the lawyers and the journalists and even the writers, but from the people that really, philosophers. It really does need these people, philosophers, artists, poets, musicians. Those are the people it needs. The intellectuals. It needs a defense, and it needs to be framed in the term of this is really progress. What we're doing here, and it's the river turns back on itself, we're avoiding the tenets of destruction. That isn't really progress. That's regression. We're reverting back to a time that's no good in human condition. We look around modern American society. Does anyone really think that there is progress in our moral character, our ethical character, in any of that? Is any of that there? What does the tradition offer these things, the counterweight to it? Has society improved because we've made all these innovations under the name of progress, but in reality are breaking down tested fences to these things? And he's talking about you know, the difference between the sexes and other things. Are we breaking these things down? Are they becoming dangerous ultimately? That's the question. And he does say that we don't need to rely on Old South symbols. But of course, those symbols have meaning. Tearing them down to the modern modernist is important because tearing them down means that they're erasing that old order and they're instituting their own version of chaos. American society is chaos today. It really is chaos. No one really knows the rules anymore because the rules are always moving. It's chaos. And in a system of chaos, there can be no peace. There can be no peace in a system of chaos. And I think that's something that Weaver was pointing out too. All right. One of those essential Southern documents, essential Southern books, you need to read it. Whether you disagree or agree with it, it's something that you have to wrestle with as part of exploring this Southern tradition and Weaver being an important part of that tradition. See you next time. See you then.